This is a Triple J podcast. If you were packing a bag for the end of the world, what is one medicine you would take? We had a caller who had seen the movie Leave the World Behind and put that question to myself and Dr. Carl. You'll find out what we chose in this science episode. Plus, medications. Why do they lower your sex drive? And could dinosaurs survive in our atmosphere today? This is Science with Dr. Carl. I'm Lucy Smith. Let's get into it. I will say there's been a couple of questions coming through and I thought we would kick off this week's episode with it. So someone has texted in saying, Dr. Carl is talking about blood balance and glycocard on Instagram. Can he talk about it today and let listeners know, listeners know which one to choose? Uh. Now, you have been, I guess, the target of, what would you call them, some... AI ads? Uh, thieves. Yeah. Thieves. What's going on? Um, okay, so a bit of background. Uh, ChatGPT today announced a new product. And what you have to do is just download 15 seconds of anybody's voice and they will then recreate what you type in that person's voice. And so it could be, hi, I'm Kim, the head of the ABC, and I want you to vote for this political party. And it'll sound just like him. And I can't see any benefit from this product, but only harm. Okay, one benefit from AI that's already here. We can now diagnose breast cancers up to five years earlier. And therefore, earlier treatment means a better outcome. Okay, I'm trying to find one good outcome from AI. Yeah. But if you go looking, you will find that on Facebook and Twitter and Facebook and Facebook and Facebook, at the moment there's about 110 to 130 people who are putting up ads claiming that I am promoting some sort of product. And um, firstly, they're saying that I'm a professor at Monash University. Mm. Secondly, that my name is both Krushelnitsky and Krushelnitsky. They're spelling it a few different ways each time. Thirdly, that the product that I'm supposed to be uh, advertising, and by the way, on Facebook and on Twitter and on Insta, it says at the top, I do not advertise any commercial product. I never have. I never will. And this is a thing. <clears throat> you think these ads are kind of obvious, but I've literally gotten a text today from Michael saying, hi, Dr. Carl, I'm wanting to know if you're really endorsing and promoting glyco control. I would like to purchase this product if it could really remove plaque from my arteries. So it just... Mm. You know, I, I, I can't stress this enough that if you're seeing Dr. Carl promoting any kind of product, any commercial product, any commercial product any. or really even trying to sway your health or, you know, it's just, it really kind of uh, take these things with a grain of salt. This is a our big, big grain of salt. PSA this yeah, morning. That's right. So uh, with regard to the removing the plaque, it says that it can remove, if you read down, two kilograms of plaque from your arteries. Mate, that is bigger than your head. Your head doesn't weigh two kilograms. You don't even have two kilograms of blood vessels. And it's saying you can remove two kilograms of plaque, one kilogram of clot, and 400 grams of calcium. Like, that, that's a big fat mug, a really huge mug of tea. That's an enormous cup of tea. They're, they're, they're just coming out with lies. So I do not promote any commercial product. I have been involved with, say, um, microsleep government campaigns and vaping campaigns, but never any commercial product. And the thing is that people, many people who have sent us email, sent me emails, Carl, I ordered the product, I spent $90, it didn't arrive. Uh. You have been scammed. I'm really sorry. I cannot stop them. We've told Facebook about this over and over and Facebook's response has been, they do not, um, something along, they do not break our advertiser guidelines. I think the advertiser guidelines are... If you've got money and you want to advertise anything, we'll take it. That, that is a hypothesis, hypothesis on my part. I'm not too sure. But Facebook has been told over and over and they refuse to do it and people are losing money. And at some stage, I, I don't know how to do it because they're based overseas in many cases and they don't follow the laws of Australia because mm. the internet is a worldwide – well, the worldwide web exists on the internet. Um I don't know what to do, say. So this is our PSA, just PSA. to stay vigilant that even if you think it might be blaringly obvious, maybe someone in your life doesn't. So just really stay vigilant out there and know that if you are seeing any ABC personality, I've seen these ads pop up with News Breakfast, Lisa Miller as well. Ah. Just know that we work for we work for a government-funded broadcaster and a taxpayer-funded broadcaster. We cannot be out here telling you to buy something or referring a commercial product. We, we cannot be involved with any commercial product. Yeah. That's it. That's the bottom line. Stay vigilant. All right, Dr. Carl, I hope that we can 
get into these questions. Cheerful things, happy things. Yeah, let's do it. We've got Anita from Adelaide Anita. here. Oh, sort of cheerful. What's going on, Anita? Oh, hello, doctors. My question is, why does Australia not have native honeybees? Um, our bees are only solitary usually, but we have honey ants. I'm wondering why they didn't, did they evolve on other continents after Australia separated out or did they evolve and, and then become extinct? Uh, I'd like the answer to that one, please. Uh, I, I think you've answered it yourself, Dr. Anita. Uh. Um, they did. So um, Australia split off from Gondwana land, Gondwana, about yep. 50 million years ago. And then everything developed independently in Australia. And the honeybees are not native to Australia. They came in Europe and Asia and Africa and they were brought to Australia and we have some here. There's also something else called the Varroa mite, V-E-R-R-O-A mite, and it does look like it's going to be doing bad things here in Australia. Each year, something like a third of a million hives beehives travel from one part of Australia to the other. I think I've got the number right. I think it's a third of a million. And they end up in one occasion in the Mildura area and they do pollination. And then they go off somewhere else to do pollination maybe of canola. And we've got to stop this to some degree because the Varroa mite, um, imported from overseas and where it's been for a long time, has finally made it to Australia. It made it to Newcastle a couple of years ago and it's spreading. And unfortunately, we're in that transition period where things are going to get messy. But to answer your specific question, Dr. Anita, um, they didn't arrive in Australia. Uh, there, there was no ecological niche that they blossomed into. Uh, but why? I don't know. Evolution is not perfect. It's just good enough, mm. I guess. Yeah, okay. All right, no worries. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Thanks, Anita. Anita. We've got Nathan in Sydney. Now, Nathan, you used to work at a pizza shop and you noticed something. What was it? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, hi, doctors. Um, yeah, my question is about ambient temperature and the way it affects the temperature of other things. Mm. So, as I said, I worked in the pizza shop for over 10 years and I consistently experienced this. Now, the pizza oven was set to 270 degrees all year round. The, the conveyor belt time was always seven minutes. And we'd pop in a garlic bread that's wrapped in aluminium foil. And on a winter's day, I could just grab it out of the oven when it came out the other end and plop it on the table. But on summer, I just it was so hot, you just had to quickly grab it or use, use tongs or something to get it off. And I just don't understand uh, if the oven's always at 270, why was it always so much hotter on a, a summer's day? Ah, in this case, we've got to go measuring. And so you need one of those little infrared laser type thermometer thingies where you can aim it and see what the temperature is. So a truly properly adjusted oven will give you 270 degrees regardless of whether the outside temperature is minus 100 or plus 100. But I'm suspecting that they're made good enough, not perfectly. And on a hot day, they'll run hotter than 270. I'm figuring that the thermostat that says switch off around 270 is not that good. Uh, so I'm figuring that it's not a, a, a perfect oven. So it, in fact, is hotter than that. Uh, the idea that it would cool down in the ambient air, is that is that possible, Dr. Nathan? Like, how long was it where it came out of the oven before you no, grabbed it? No, it was like sometimes it'd just be yeah, out for like a few seconds before you grabbed it. But is it possible that some of the cooler room air could have gone into the out? of the oven. He said it was on a conveyor belt. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. yeah, look, we've got to, in this case, you need to measure some temperatures. The information will come by knowing the temperatures in different parts mm. of the uh, oven chain. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Nathan, you've got to go back to that pizza shop yeah, and start working again. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Great. Enjoy so your back job. In, in Korea. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. We've got Heath in Quakers Hill here. Now, Heath, got a question about dogs. Morning, doctors. My question is, uh, why do dogs chase and bite their own tails? Um, dogs like to play, like humans, and it could be just plain old playfulness. Oh, here's a body part. I'll go chasing it in circles. I'm seeing that with my little granddaughter, age 16 months. She gets fascinated by different things and the nieces of different ages as well. Secondly, there can be irritation. There can be a bug biting it. Um, they could do it because on one occasion when they uh, went and bit their tail, everybody said, hey, look at Freddo playing with their tail. And they're thinking, oh, they're paying attention to me. I love having attention. Uh, they, 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 dogs can have mental problems. 
things. They can do compulsive behaviour. I'm slightly obsessive with making sure the house is locked before I leave, but I know people who, even when they've done it, they have to go back and do it again and again and again. Mm. And this sort of behaviour can exist in dogs as well. Um, That's kind of it. You know, I don't know more than that. If we could have a vet ring in. Mm. Um, hang on. It's 04 something, something, something. I've forgotten the number. <laughs> Help me do. 0439 757 Text in if you are maybe an animal behaviour psychologist, etc. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Heath. We've got Scott and Foster here. Now, Scott, I love this question. You've just seen a movie. Um, tell us about it and tell us what your kind of thoughts were off the back. Uh, well, I suppose it was, yeah, it's the movie where, like, basically the world goes into chaos. And I suppose riding off the back now watching the latest Alone series on SBS. Mm. And it was a conversation went, well, like, what would you grab? Like, you know, as far as, like, when I was sort of saying medicine, so maybe we all do that sort of little naughty thing of leaving, you know, extra um, stuff in the kitchen, in the bathroom cabinet, you know, maybe some... Uh, antibiotics, and I thought I wasn't going to take some antibiotics. If, had, if the world was about to end, what would Dr. Carl take? Mm, what's Ooh. the one medicine you would take, Dr. Carl, if it's kind of giving end of days, end of the world? This is off the back of the film, Leave the World Behind. And how many things are you allowed to take in your head? What, what you can carry in a little backpack, or yeah, but yeah, what's yep. the one? So, Scott, you want to know the one medicine that Dr. Carl would take? Yeah, I want to know, yes. Probably antibiotics, something Mm. like flucloxacillin is a broad-spectrum antibiotic, uh, works against cellulitis um, and a bunch of other things. Probably a a painkiller would be nice. Um, I do like the fact that when you go to see the dentist, you get access to a painkiller. What would you take, uh, Scott? Well, um, yeah, I'm definitely taking my antibiotics, but I also have um, I have a metal aortic valve, so I probably have to take some of my um, um, other stuff would keep me going as well. You've got a metal aortic valve. Can you hear it from the outside going tick, tick, tick? Oh, I can hear it between my ears all the time, about 65 times a minute. Wow. And <laughs> how long have you had that like for? The, um, 12, 14 years. Wow. So what happens normally is that the blood is taken from chamber to chamber in the heart by very beautifully synchronised and coordinating opening of chambers and closing and squeezing. And normally you have it going out through the aortic valve in through the aorta, which is the diameter of your thumb. But in your case, you've got a valve, which is, I'm guessing, it's a ball covered with silicon rubber inside a metal cage. And it hits up against some other silicon rubber. And... That can be bad to the blood cells, so you've got to take an anticoagulant, is that right? Yep, that's right. Yeah, so that's yours. What would you take, Lucy? (laughs) Ibuprofen, I think. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, pain doesn't make you a better person. Mm. Okay, are you allowed to take anything like a knife or a hammer or a chisel or... Might take all those things, but yeah, something might keep you going. My wife reckons she might take any depressants with her. Oh, true. (laughs) <laughs> uh, it's a joke. It was a joke. Okay, all no, right. I'm a yeah. dick. Okay, fair enough. All right. Okay, thank you, Dr. I, Scott. Yeah, Scott, you got me thinking now. I'm just you think of all the things that you got to take every so often. Yeah. Hmm. Well, Iron tablet. True. Uh, the only real tools you need are a hammer and a file, and with that you can make anything up to a jet engine. Oh. <laughs> okay, Dr. Carl, we need you on the new series <laughs> of Alone, okay? Okay. Nick in Armadale here. Dr. Nick, you have a question. We were just talking about, you know, what we would take if it was the end of days and we needed to take some sort of medicine with us. And I said painkillers, ibuprofen. Nick, you've got a question about painkillers. What is it? I do. Uh, Hello, doctors. Um, So it seems like there's not many options for painkillers, as in over the counter, it's paracetamol and ibuprofen. And then even in prescription land and, you know, heavy stuff in hospital, it's nearly all in an opioid kind of family, which is, you know, scary sort of stuff. Um, My question is, why don't we have more painkillers, more varieties and better kind of more accessible pain treatment options with modern medicine? Um, Because we haven't fully explored pain. We know of three groups of people in the world who do not experience pain. Um, Firstly, you've got 37 trillion cells in your body. And they each have a pump that shoves sodium one way and potassium the other way. And when I started university medicine, there was one. Now there's about 
20 of them, and an abnormality in, I think, type number 17, and this abnormality happens in a Pakistani family of circus performers, meaning they do not feel pain. Um, and they normally die in their early 20s from a broken leg which doesn't hurt or a broken this that doesn't hurt. Secondly, there's a group of people in Italy. We don't know their pathway. Um, and thirdly, there's a woman in England who has pain mediation via the marijuana pathway. So the reason that opiates work is that you make your own opium in your brain, uh, that you actually make morphine. You've probably heard the word endorphin. Endorphin is short for endogenous. Endo means from within. Genus means you make it. So they get e- endogenous morphine and they get rid of the middle bit and you're left with just endorphin. And so the way, the reason that opiates work is you make your own opiates. The reason that marijuana works is you make your own marijuana. And this woman in England, um, her husband died and she, she doesn't feel pain. But when her husband died, her first response was, I I just bought a season ticket on a bus. I'm going to have to catch it in. So she's sort of slightly dissociated from reality. But the thing is that there are potential painkillers down that pathway. In most cases, we can get rid of pain. There's certain types of pain that we cannot get rid of, like neuropathic pain. And in those cases, we put in things into the spine usually that put electrical impulses and you work it by a remote control. And there was a, sorry to say, funny case where um, it accidentally, did some cross wiring and every time she did it to get rid of the pain she also had an orgasm and she got sick of it it was just like i just want to get rid of the pain no i do not want to have a good time right now i just want to get rid of the pain so um we don't fully understand pain we only started working with pain nerves maybe 20 years ago so i guess the answer is we're still in early days with pain relief yeah that makes sense that yeah we've got to yeah use what the body does in kind of artificial versions is it the same with ibuprofen and paracetamol does the body naturally produce those uh, I think they work by stopping inflammation. I do not know the pathway. I, 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 I used to know the pathway by which they work, but I didn't know. I don't think I looked up the pathway by which they relieve the pain. I think they do it by relieving the inflammation locally. I do not know. This is homework for me. Thank you so much for telling me. But I don't, So I don't know <laughs> if we make our own natural aspirin or ibuprofen. I don't think we do. I think they work by a different pathway. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. And, and the opiates work centrally in your brain and the marijuana uh, works centrally in your brain. And for some people, it re- reduces pain, but not for everybody. Right. Depending if you've got that pathway or not. And yeah, because we're all wired differently. Like we just discovered 3,300 new nerve cells uh, in the different types of nerve cells in the brain last October, which we didn't know existed before. So there's so much we don't know. Well, wow, yes, a big black hole in the human head, right? <laughs> Dead right. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> We've Thank got you, Dean Nick. from Perth Dean? here. Dean, what's your question? Um, it's about the results of what happens with animal inbreeding. I mean, originally my question started from when they brought back Dolly the sheep and they talked about bringing back the thylacine. I thought, great, bring it back from extinction just to watch it go back into extinction again. Or do we bring back 20, 30, 40 of them to give them a gene pool? And then I read about a pride of Asiatic lions, the last of the Asiatic lions in a uh, reserve in Goa. Mm -hmm. And they're all cousins. So what's their future? Do they die off or do they malform or do they what what happens if you give them enough time they will develop some genetic diversity with time cheetahs went through an evolutionary bottleneck about eight thousand years ago and all the cheetahs today are so closely related that you can do a skin graft from one to the other and you don't have to worry about immunosuppression because they're that closely related. So it all depends on how quickly they mutate, and apparently cheetahs are mutating very slowly. So which specific thing are you asking about then? Well, well it, if all the lines are related, mm. that it, that they're inbreeding. So, I mean, they, they did a blood test on all the last of the pride, and they're all cousins. Okay, so, so well, uh, we, we know what happened with cheetahs, that they're very slow at mutating. It could be the, the lions, which are part of the, that cat feline family, um, would be slow or fast, and we don't know. So it'd be an evolutionary oh, molecular biologist who specialises in the big cats who'd be able to tell us on that. So they, they, we may well be able to bring them back, we may not. And with regard to the thylacines, well, that was a terrible thing, we killed them, believing that they were actually killing the sheep, but in fact that they were helping protect the sheep. But it was just a big mistake on humanity's part. Clever humans once again. Yeah. 
We've got Amelia in Brisbane now. Amelia. Now, Amelia, you've got a question about mammals. What's, what's your question? Hi, doctors. My question is, why do mammals need to be at certain temperatures to function? And if our blood was thinner, would we be able to function at a lower temperature? Uh, so it's not so much thinner. So blood is an organ that happens to be a liquid. It's 45% cells, 55% salt water, and it does a whole bunch of functions. Looking at the cold-blooded side of things, we keep our temperature at the same level, and so we are optimised for being able to function through the day and the night. Snakes, if you see them in the daytime, you're not going to see them at night because they can't move. They're in a state called torpor. So the cost of us being able to function all day and all night in the environment is that we have to have huge amounts of food, whereas the reptiles can go without food for weeks or sometimes even months at a time. So as a result, we've evolved down a pathway where the enzymes that are necessary to kick reactions along, they work best at a certain temperature range. So the temperature range we work at is maybe 35 to 40. And outside that, bad things happen. Bad things are already happening at 40. Under about 35, I can say, Amelia, grab my hand and I'll pull you out of the water and you'll look at me and you won't be able to clutch your um, fingers around my wrist and grab me. We can't pull you out. Um, another thing is that the cell membranes, and you've got 37 trillion cells, they've been optimised to work only in that very narrow range and the same with proteins and your brain. So it gives us the ability to roam the planet, but the cost is we've got to keep on eating. Whereas on the other hand, the pythons will do that. Think about a horse for the Melbourne Cup. It is running and it's going flat out and is running for about four minutes or whatever it is. A python can run at four times that level of metabolic activity for 36 hours. And what they're doing when they've swallowed something is that they're growing their gut back and they're growing their liver and they're manufacturing acids like crazy and they're just lying there panting and they are just absorbing and manufacturing the acids to dissolve that creature which could be bigger than a very large dog. So, But most of the time they just lie around um, not, not burning up much energy at all. Wow. It is amazing to think that pythons can work that hard and a, a snake mm. will do that as hard. You can see the bulge in their body when they've swallowed a rat? Mm. Massive. Well, I've only seen pictures of it. I haven't seen it either. No. Thanks, Amelia. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you. Thank you. Zach. You got... Zach. <laughs> Zach in Barara. Zach. You've got a question about rain. What is it? Yeah. Hey, doctors. So my question is um, why are some uh, raindrops bigger than others? Mm. So for rain to form, you've got to have little tiny particles in the atmosphere that act as nucleation centres. And if you've got a dirty environment, which is highly polluted, the raindrops can be bigger because um, they can form more coalescence. Secondly, if you have upcurrents, the rain starts to fall down and then it gets blown upwards and it runs into other raindrops. And it gets heavier and then it falls down. So now you've got a bigger, fatter raindrops. Thirdly, you have a similar process happening with hail where it just goes up and down, up and down until it gets heavy enough to break through the updraft. In that case, the updrafts are very strong and you can have, in extreme cases, hail the size of golf stones, golf balls. All right. Thanks, Zach. I love that real dollopy rain. Oh, where it just sort of goes splop, splop, splop. Yeah. Oh, I, I love that from when I was living in the tropics because it would rain every afternoon at about 10 past four when I was in Ley and you just hear this sort of blop, blop, blop and then within 60 seconds it was so wet that if you went out in it, you'd be wet into your armpits. You just walk out of it, walk back in, wet into your armpits, mate. It was really solid. Oh my gosh. Stephen in Toowoomba. You do a bit of camping. You've noticed something. Morning, doctors. My question is... How come every time I go camping, so I do a lot of camping in a, in a swag, so it's not a dome swag, so it's just like a, a drover swag, so a lay flat one. I can leave my head out all night while sleeping and never get bit by mosquitoes, but as soon as I put my arm or my foot out, I get bitten straight away. Why ah, would that be? Different sweat glands. So you've got a lot of sweat glands in your hands and the sweat itself isn't particularly um, attractive to mosquitoes, but depending on the bacteria you have on your skin they will eat that and then create a whole bunch of other chemicals which are attractive. So you've got different types of sweat glands and sweat on your face and your arms. So that's the best we've got up with at the moment that the chemicals are more attractive. On the other hand, your face does have the wonderful property of putting out carbon dioxide. And so the um, in general, the mozzies are attracted to the carbon dioxide uh, because they know that's the source of an animal that's breathing and they bite you not to annoy you but to get 
protein from your blood to fill their baby. So it's the female mozzies being nice to their future babies. How can you possibly deny them, you know, like the miracle of life? They're obsessed with me. (laughs) Really? Love me, yeah. In in my family group, they love all of the females in my family Uh, and they don't like me. I can just go outside. You know, we... I was with some friends recently and we thought, oh, we'll eat out on the on the veranda. And I even had one of those little, puts them on her kid, those little mosquito patches that you mm-hmm. can just wear on your clothes. Nah, eating alive on my feet. It's the deep stuff, mate. That's the stuff that works. Ugh, we've got Amanda in Bendigo. Amanda, what's your question? Hi, doctors. My question is, why do some medications reduce your sex drive? Um, because you're a little powerhouse of hormones. You run via chemicals um, yeah. and running the whole show is the hypothalamus, which is called the conductor of the hormone orchestra. And there are multiple feedback loops. And so sex drive is related to both estrogen and testosterone. And so it's really easy that if you're taking something that's going to, for example, save your life, oh, by the way, you're going to interfere with this and lose your sex drive for a little while or have it increased. Also, that happens. So it's normally mediated via the hypothalamus and a feedback loop there. Um, You can try and look around for medications that have different side effects. So if you go back 500 years, Paracelsus said all drugs are poisons. What matters is the dose. So you can go and check with your GP and say, I know this is something that sometimes happens happening to me. I'm having this happening to me. Can you find a medication that has the same uh, effects but doesn't have this side effect? And you, normally there's a range of things you can try. Okay. I like that you called me a powerhouse. That was pretty exciting. <laughs> yes. Um, and, so, and so I'm talking about um, like hormone blockers for mm-hmm. cancer treatment. So just, that just kind of wipes that whole thing out. Is that what you're saying? Uh, in this particular case, um, I'm very sorry to hear that you've got cancer, uh, a, a cancer. Is, yep. How's your prognosis? Um, good. Yep, good. Um, all good. Breast cancer. And um, all rebuilt with fabulous new boobs. Ah, oh, look, by the way, uh, for those who don't know, the word pro means before and gnosis comes from nore to know. So prognosis means uh, how things are going. And normally uh, what the person with cancer is interested in is the prognosis for, and here comes a magic phrase, five-year survival rate. If you've got a 90 or 100% survival, five-year survival rate, you're very happy. If it's less than 1%, you're not happy. Mm. So normally with cancer, the cancers, we just sort of tend to go in boots and all and we sort of, they tend to say, look, we, we're sorry, we haven't got a drug yet that will leave other things untouched. That's just the way it is. Look, it is worthwhile checking with your uh, doctors and let them know that you want something different if possible. But you might right. not have that option at the moment with our current yep. knowledge. Georgie on the Gold Coast, you have a question on behalf of your kids. What what have you guys been talking about lately? Hi, Dr. Carl and Dr. Lucy. Um, we have gone dino crazy <laughs> in this house. Um, so we've got a question about the dinosaurs. And if we manage to clone the dinosaurs today, like they did in Jurassic Park, mm-hmm. given that twenty million oh sorry, two hundred million years ago, there was more oxygen in the atmosphere than there was is today, which apparently led to giant insects as well. Would the dinosaurs grow to their full potential and would they actually be able to survive in our modern day atmosphere? Ah, they survived for an incredibly long period of time from 220 million years ago um, right up to 65 million years ago. And if you include the birds as dinosaurs, which they are, they're still around today. So the, the technical term they use is the non-avian which is a fancy non-bird dinosaurs died out, but the dinosaurs are still around today. Um, Back 350 million years ago, there were, in fact, giant insects because the oxygen level was up around 30%, 35%. But when the dinosaurs started off, the oxygen level was down to about 11%. And there were three types of animals back then. There were the crocodiles, who owned, the reptiles, who had the legs out to the side. That was a big disadvantage. There were the mammals, and they had the legs under the hips, which was a big disadvantage. But the oxygen level was very low. And we mammals, we've got the disadvantage that we um, dilute the incoming oxygen-rich air with what is left in the lungs. Whereas the uh, dinosaurs and the birds have got a different system. The air comes in and goes into the lungs, gives up its oxygen and then goes into the hollow bones. 
So they've got a sort of a throughput system. As a result of that superior breathing mechanism, they were able to survive from uh, 220 million years ago to 65, and the oxygen level gradually rose from about 11 to about 16%. So they would survive in the higher oxygen of today. Uh, but there's a book on this by Helen Pilcher, and I've done a podcast with her on Shirtloads of Science, and the book is called Bring Back the King, referring to Elvis Presley. Mm. And then she goes on to how you could bring back other animals, including dinosaurs. The best way to bring back the dinosaurs would be um, probably by going into the modern dinosaurs. You see, there's not much DNA left from 65 million years ago, but the birds have got all sorts of stuff inside their DNA that could take us back to Tyrannosaurus rex, to whom they're vaguely related. Amazing. Yeah. So, the, in fact, I just saw the photos last night. I'll, I'll let you in on it. They've managed to breed a six-legged mouse. Not breed, <gasps> but the, uh, so what happens is they had a look at the DNA, and part of the DNA switches off during making the legs, and they switched off the bit that switches off, and they switch it on again, and then you end up with a six-legged mouse just to see what was going on. So we still don't understand full embryology. But the thing is that almost certainly within the chicken and bird DNA, there are big hints of the other dinosaur DNA. That's amazing. So we could bring them back maybe. 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 That's a definite maybe. Georgie, thank you so much. We've got Alex in Sydney here. Dr. Alex, you want to chat about something Dr. Carl referenced earlier? Yes. Good morning, Dr. Lucy. Good morning, Dr. Carl. Welcome. I was... I was just wondering how you make a jet engine from a hammer and a file. Ah, okay. So the two basic tools are a hammer and a file. And a hammer is a hard rock that doesn't splinter. And a file is a different textured hard rock that you can rub against things. And with the hammer, you can make things change shape and you can weld them together. And with a file, you can make them change shape by removing material. So on one stage, we were travelling in the Gibson Desert and the clutch cable broke on our four-wheel drive and we hadn't seen another person for three weeks and there was nobody we were going to see for another week. And the clutch cable broke. Luckily, I had a spare. I took it out of the packet. It was the wrong one. They'd put the wrong one. The number on the clutch cable was different from the number on the packet. It had been sitting there for eight years with the wrong thing. And so I had to do a bit of welding to add metal, which I did by bridging the batteries together, and then remove metal with a file. And it took me about a day, but I made it change shape to what it was needed. And it wasn't the best weld, and it broke, but it got us out of the Gibson Desert, and we were able to get another one that was properly made. So you start off with just two rocks. You then get a fire going, and you get some clay, and you make your mini blast furnace. Look this up on YouTube, Veritasium, Peter Lebedev and Derek Mueller. He goes to where they make a $150,000 sword. Japanese sword the old way. And they get this blast furnace going uh, once a year and it runs for 36 hours. So what you do is you get a sand which is rich in iron and you get charcoal and you grind them all up and you blow hot air through it. And in the old days, you have a fire and you'd have strong people standing on bellows working for 36 hours and you blow this hot air through this thing you've made of clay and you've got sand and charcoal and the sand's got iron in it and then after 36 hours, you let it cool down and now you've got yourself some iron. You've gone from no metal to metal. Then you do things to that. You add carbon to make it a bit harder, not too much. And so you work your way up into having your hammer and your file. From that, you then start working your way up the process and you can end up with a jet engine. But you've got to have that knowledge that we've so painfully gathered. The first steel was about 4,000 years ago in Africa, I th- we think. And 5,000 years ago, you could get copper, lumps of copper lying on the ground. And 11,000 years ago, in the Middle East, they were making tools of copper. Wow. So what we're saying is, Dr. Carl, that maybe you should be on the next season of Alone so you could make an engine out in the wilderness. True, but I need the technology that the Egyptians developed for us 4,000 years ago. 5,000 years ago, they made transparent rock. And because of those bits of transparent rock sitting on my face, we call them glasses, I can now see and be useful to society. Final question, Abby in Newcastle. you got a Abby? question about cheese, which I love. What is it? Hi, doctors. Um, so this is a bit of a two-parter question. Um, I've been really interested because I've been hearing about brie cheese and camembert. The mould is going extinct. So I want to know how old is it 
the mould itself and why is it going extinct? Why can't they just keep making it? Um, okay, so when you get Brio Cambert, which are the soft cheeses, the waxy coating on the outside is actually the dead bodies of the mould and some different types of stuff that they've made as well. So that's not a separate coating they've put on the outside. You need a fungus involved, and the fungus, which is called penicillin, like penicillin, the antibiotic, penicillin camemberti, is not going extinct, but it has very low genetic diversity. Mm. Now, nature is bloody in tooth and claw, and if another creature comes along, like a bacterium or a virus, and attacks it, there's not enough genetic diversity. So all of the narrow range of fungi that makes brie and camembert could be wiped out. There are other versions of um, penicillin camembertii that exist, but they make it with what people regard as unattractive colours like green or purple. You, you kind of used to think, this is cheese, I want it white, I don't want a purple one, it's wrong. Mm. But, we, but we, we could find genetic diversity down that pathway. And now that we know what's going on, we can try and bring back some genetic diversity with engineering techniques which we haven't developed yet. Oh, that's interesting. And that's good to hear and because then, we love yeah. a bit of brie. Oh, and I, I love, I mean, a country that has 4,000 different types of cheese, you've got to love it. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Science with Dr. Carl. And if you are part of the podcast fam but you want to ask a question, remember, you can put yours forward on the Triple J text line, Thursdays, 11 till 12 on 0439 757 And you could be a part of history part of the podcast feed, Immortalised. My name is Lucy Smith. This episode was produced by Sarah Harvey and we will catch you next week. Thanks. Bye. Dave Marchese here from the Triple J Hack team. Hey, if you love Dr. Carl's podcast like I do, you might enjoy the Hack podcast as well. Each day we bring you the news that matters to you, from the latest science on climate change to what's happening in politics and news around the world. The Hack Podcast. It's your daily fix of the news you need to know. Get it wherever you're listening now.